My name is Paul Shepard. I'm a beekeeper and I've been a beekeeper for pretty much about 25 years. Um, I've kept bees in Trinidad, in the Caribbean, St. Lucia, in California, in the United States. And I work with the Center for Honey Bee Research in Asheville, North Carolina. I am very interested in um, natural beekeeping and that's my main aim is to uh, help people understand that natural beekeeping is actually the way that we really want to go. Um, and we're talking about natural beekeeping here as compared to commercial beekeeping. Now, natural beekeeping, people say, um, well, we don't even keep bees in a natural way. We keep them in a box. We keep them in a row, 25 hives to an, a very small space. Uh, naturally speaking, beehives are in the forest, you know, in trees that are 500 yards apart, um, usually uh, 10 to 15 feet up in the air, um, inside of a log, in, a, in what they call a gum. This, these are natural, um, the bees in their natural state. However, uh, we need and we want to work with bees and to reap honey and, and high products. So we're looking for the middle road and the best way to go. And recently that we, in the last uh, 10 years, we've been going through a lot of problems with what's called colony collapse disorder. We've lost a lot of bees, especially in the United States. Some people losing over 100% of all their hives. Big honey producers collapsing. The story is well documented and anybody that's interested in colony collapse disorder can have go and take a look. Now when they when this happened it was in a way a terrible thing. It is a it is a terrible thing, but in a way it was a blessing because right away everyone started asking the questions why? And the question is what are the bees trying to tell us? Why are we losing bees? Colony collapse disorder is Bees that just leave a hive, sometimes they leave their queen, they leave honey, they leave brood, and they disappear. There's no dead bees, there's nothing to look for, there's, can't figure out what it is. Everything from cell phones, to telephone poles, to uh, pesticides, to beekeeping, everything has been looked at. And what we are finding now is that the main culprits seem to be us, human beings, and the way that we raise our, that we do agriculture, the way that we raise animals, the way that we live, all seem to be affecting how the bees are. And another thing is happening as well is that the methods that beekeepers have been using seems to show that there is a problem with beekeeping. Now, <clears throat> The Green Revolution, which was the agricultural revolution, as we know it started off somewhere in the 1940s, you know, um, when a lot of the products from the uh, Second World War were going to be used in agriculture. Things like uh, nitrogen uh, fertilizers and, and all this sort of stuff were, were put back into agriculture and showed great benefits. Boost agriculture, pesticides, um, mechanization, you know, um, this has made a, a huge mark on agriculture, but it has shown some negative effects, a lot of negative negative effects, in fact, and one of them is that we are losing bees. What we have found today is that with the push for uh, monocrops, huge monocrops, especially in the United States up in the north, is creating runoff down the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico and creating dead zones. And I, I think there's something like 400, 407 dead zones throughout the world, which are oceans, uh, dead zones are uh, areas at the, at the bottom of the ocean where there's no oxygen, a complete dead zone, no plants, no fish, nothing can grow there. And these are the kind of things I think we have to be looking at. And the bees are sort of showing us that we definitely are doing something wrong. Bees have been around for millions of years. 
the first known bee, I think uh, there's a fossil that showed up a hundred million years ago. And there's some uh, evidence of bees being around 40 million years ago. Now, therefore, bees know something about survival. They've been through ice ages and climate changes, but somehow they've been able to survive. There was a guy called uh, Rudolf Steiner in, in 1923 that spoke about bees and said that the way that we were raising our queens would be detrimental to bees in a hundred years. And perhaps this is happening. Perhaps this is what we are seeing today. Uh, <clears throat> when we talk to commercial beekeepers, now commercial beekeepers are guys with 20,000 hives, 25,000 hives. Their industry is about producing honey, about pollination. They take millions of hives. Uh, I think it's, um, it's 1.4 million hives or 1.3 million hives go to the almonds in California every year to pollinate the almonds. The almonds are 100% pollinated by bees. And it is acre upon acre of non-ending almond trees without anything in it. It is virtually a desert to bees because having just one crop to feed off of creates, there's no diversity. And this bees come back from that very sick, and very ill. And this is kind of something that we need to look at as well. Uh, why? What commercial beekeepers say that they cannot produce sufficient honey or sufficient hive products through natural beekeeping and that trying to use natural beekeeping to raise bees would not be beneficial. My question is, there are, what is the cost of commercial beekeeping when you really look at it? Every year there are losses, every year there are they have to visit the hive several times because they have to put in uh, treatments. They have to use, they have to buy chemicals and apply chemicals and then remove the chemicals. They have to requeen their hive. Sometimes they have to buy new bees every year and start all over up to 35%. The number has dropped a bit, but 35% requeening and, and, uh, and putting back in hives and you know, there is a cost to that. What is, the, what is the cost of not doing all of that, raising bees in a natural way, getting bees to be healthy and strong and to fend off most of the pests and parasites and, and uh, diseases that bees are getting naturally? Is it possible? That's something we need to discuss. Man has been looking at different ways of uh, improving beekeeping and making it more beneficial. He's also been looking at agriculture and trying to make agriculture more profitable and more beneficial. Now we, right now we're looking at ge genetically modified organisms, genetically modified plants. Uh, we have uh, monocropping, loads and loads of, of, of corn or soya. Um, these are all deserts to honeybees and it creates a, a loss of diversity, affects honeybees. Years ago, um, my men started experimenting with ways to raise better and bigger bees. So they wanted to try to work on the, um, the foundation, the uh, wax foundation that we put into frames. Now I'll just show you a uh, sample here of something. So this is uh, the foundation that goes into a Langstroth hive. Uh, this is actually a plastic foundation. This one in particular is uh, actually for drones, but it gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. So what they did was imprint the cell size onto the foundation. And if you look closely here, you can see the imprint of the cell on the foundation. Now this one is for drone bees but uh, they mostly um, they had worker bee foundation. The idea was to get the bees not to build any more drones, not to produce 
to, or to produce less drones and to produce more worker bees and to produce larger size worker bees. The bees were building slightly smaller cells and creating smaller bees. They wanted bigger bees because they felt bigger bees would gather more honey and be stronger and more healthy. So these guys started fiddling around with these uh, cell sizes and we've been living with that for over a hundred years and now we're in trouble. The funny thing is that if you take bees into a hive and allow them to build their own, own foundation, produce their own wax, they will build it smaller than normal. They'll build it smaller than the size of the cell on the foundation. Now that's very interesting to me because that means that genetically they have kept a size in their, in their, in their being that they then will put out there when they're left to themselves. People have discovered that, uh, scientists have discovered that bees at the equator build larger cells than bees further up north or further down south in colder countries. Bees up in the mountains build cells that are slightly larger than the bees down at the ocean. Now, regionally and according to zones, bees d build different size cells. So they are adapting to the area where they're growing. But what, what are we doing? We're giving them a standard for every single area, one particular standard. So these are things that we want to look at. And these are things that we want the bees to be able to do on their own. Uh, I would like to talk now about all the different um, standards that we try to keep when we're talking about natural beekeeping. The key principles of natural beekeeping are bees are best in their local environment. It's best to have your local bees. If you're buying bees from someone and you want to start beekeeping, try to get bees from someone in your area. These bees will be better adapted to the climate conditions of your situation. And we try to, we try to do that. Importing bees into our country has, brings problems. On the island of St. Vincent in the Caribbean, they had a, uh, Italian bees um, and they wanted they brought in queens uh, from overseas and apparently these queens had uh, American fowl brood and pretty much wiped out all the beekeeping on the island for a while they had to import bees from St. Lucia the island next door to be able to uh, replenish their stocks so I'd be very careful about importing bees into a, a a new environment. Some people have heard people talking about bringing bees from the north to live in warm tropical conditions or you know be careful too about Africanized bees because you can also inadvertently import Africanized bees if you're bringing in bees from somewhere in South America or the southern part of the United States. Uh, these bees are just about everywhere so you've got to be um, you've got to be careful. We also want bees to build their own comb. We don't want to uh, put in foundation, We're trying to get away from using that. Another thing about foundation is that this wax that the foundation is made from comes from big companies that produce beekeeping supplies. It's not their fault, but the wax that they are using and recycling has come from beekeepers throughout the country. The chemicals in the wax, there, there are chemicals in the wax, but the main chemicals in that wax is chemicals used by beekeepers. Comafloss, fluvalinate are showing up at the highest. These are chemicals that beekeepers have been using to fight the varroa mite, and they have found themselves as a residue in that wax. Now when they recycle this wax and use it as foundation, the foundation is coming to you with a certain percentage of these chemicals already in it. So I would be very concerned about that and that's something that we try to get away from in natural beekeeping. Bees need to build their own comb. It is very important. 
We want to also maintain the nest scent. It is very important to bees. Bees work with chemistry. They work with scent. Inside the hive, they literally coat the inside of the hive with propolis and create a sterile area, an area that does not that has antibiotic, antifungal, antimicrobial activity. It has a protective layer inside the cell. This protects the bees where they are and keeps them keeps them healthy. We try to not go into hives very often so that the nest scent remains the same throughout that time. Also in northern countries during winter and cold times opening up constantly opening up the hive releases you know the bees have to build back up that core temperature every time you keep opening up the hive. If you're working on a hive when the temperature is down in the 50s and you take the cover off, if you don't have gloves on, you can actually feel the warmth coming up from inside the hive. So it's a good idea not to disturb it as much as possible. We try to feed bees their own honey, not sugar. Try to stay away from sugar. If you can keep honey for a rainy day, a real rainy day it's better to feed bees honey I'm not here to talk about the difference between sugar and honey but honey is far more nutritious and contains far more en enzymes and amino acids and a whole bunch of stuff that is beneficial to bees whereas sugar is something that's been processed and it's almost depleted of anything other than the actual sugars that are in it which is what bees go for but if you really want healthy bees, you need to feed them honey and their own honey. Don't take honey from another apiary and feed your bees. This is a very important thing. American fowl brood can be transferred this way. That is why uh, importation into small countries of honey from other countries that have American fowl brood and some of these diseases is a very dangerous practice. You know, although you may use the honey and you try to be very careful. You may leave a spoon or an empty jar and throw it in the trash. When the bees go into the trash, they, will, they go into the uh, garbage dump and they will take that honey out of that bottle, take it back to the hive and perhaps start an epidemic. So we have to be very careful about those kind of things. In natural beekeeping, we do not treat our bees. Now, here we come to a little debatable problem. People say, you know, are you gonna just watch your bees die? A lady was saying the other day, she said, well, she has kids. If her kids have the flu or they have some kind of problem or some health issue, she's, going to, she's not gonna watch her kid die because she wants to breed a stronger strain. Of course, that's, I wouldn't even compare that, but here's what. How many children can you make in a lifetime? How many genetic, you know, diversities or the di genetic changes can you make with the human being in a lifetime? And how many genetic changes can you make with bees in one year? So, uh, a worker bee changes every 21 days, uh, a drone every 24 days. You could have a, a new queen every three months if, uh, you know, if you if you really wanted to, so it, the possibility of the possibility of change in a hive is much higher. And every time that queen goes out to mate, she mates with seven to twelve, fifteen drones. What is very interesting about when she mates, she takes the sperm from the drone, but she doesn't keep all. She ejects some of it so that the next drone that you know, releases his semen into her. Um, she will do the same thing again. This way, she guarantees diversity. She guarantees that one drone is not going to have 80% of his sperm in there. Every drone has a certain amount. This is quite an interesting um, genetic move on the part of bees. And I think it's really largely responsible for their ability to adapt. 
So if we allow bees to do what they're supposed to do, we allow them to have drones if they want drones. We don't take away the drones. We don't destroy drones. We allow bees to make whatever they want to do. Whenever they want to make drones, we allow them. The drones are important. The most misunderstood part of any beehive is the drone. Now these drones will go out and mate with the queens. They create queens that have um, so many different daughters from different uh, um, fathers, these drones. When there's a problem in the hive, some of the, some of the daughters may, may die out. For example, in a winter situation, you may find that you'll have daughters of a particular um, a drone. They, those, those bees will not be able to keep warm long enough and they may die out. But there may be another set that may have, from another drone, that may have that genetic ability to stay warm and therefore survive. This is what we have to look at when we are talking about keeping bees naturally, is to allow them to do what they know the best way to do. I keep saying something, right? I keep saying bees know more about bees than people do. Uh, and I like to stick to that because I think it's a real important thing. Maybe a silly statement, but if you really let the bees do the thinking for you, they'll, they'll solve the problems, I think. So we don't treat colonies with pesticides and medications. There's a ton of stuff out there. The United States um, Department of Agriculture has tested wax and found how many different chemicals in it, pesticides mostly used in modern agriculture, and pesticides used by beekeepers. The pesticides used by beekeepers, as I've said before, are the predominant pesticides in the wax. So don't use it. Now the other thing about that is that every time we use a pesticide in a hive, we take away the bees ability to deal with what the situation is naturally. Okay, let's talk about varroa mite. We've been treating varroa mite since they came on, they came. But different bees, Apis serrana in Asia, deal and live with the varroa mite. Africanized bees can live to a great extent with uh, varroa mite. We are not allowing our bees time to develop a resistance and the ability to cope with and, and live with varroa mite. Of course, there are some good beekeepers and, and breeders that have started with the hygienic um, bees and the varroa sensitive bees and all this sort of stuff. And the Russian bees seem to have these these qualities as well. Yes, but if we uh, breed from survivor stock, then the stock that we are breeding from, and a lot of beekeepers, Michael Bush, Les Crowder, to name a few, have uh, Ross Conrad, Conrad as well. All these guys have done um, breeding from their own survivor stock and no longer use pesticides or chemicals to, to keep varroa away. They are pesticide free in their hives. So if they can do it, and they can manage a thousand hives, then everybody should be capable of doing it. We just have to learn how. We only harvest the amount of honey from the bees that we need. And, well, not that we need, sorry. We only harvest, let me put that a different way. We only harvest excess honey, the honey that the bees don't actually need. And they usually say to leave about 60 pounds of honey on a hive. You know, it depends on the hive, but try not to take too much honey. This is what uh, is the argument with the commercial beekeepers. The commercial beekeepers want to take all the honey, then they want to come back and they maybe feed them with sugar. That's, what we, that's why we're running into problems. And not only sugar, they've been feeding them with high fructose corn syrup by the tanker load. And you cannot expect bees to build up health and strength and vitality and be diverse in that sort of a situation. You're killing bees like that. We have to look at the cost of doing those sort of things. The, one of the things that comes up in natural beekeeping is that we try not to stimulate brood rearing um, artificially by 
feeding in advance of a honey flow. So beekeepers would, um, they would start to feed their bees uh, sugar solutions uh, maybe a month before they expect certain plants to start flowering so that the bees will build up their population and be ready to, to bring in bees, to bring in nectar. This is, uh, this is showing um, negative effects because it is the bees are building up when there isn't sufficient pollen available. And pollen is very, very important for bees. They don't only live off of nectar, but they also live off of pollen. Pollen is a source of protein and nectar is a source of carbohydrate. They need pollen to, to build healthy brood. And if you stimulate your bees at a time when there are not much pollen available, you'll find that you'll have your your brood will not be as uh, strong or healthy as they should be. If you find you if you run into a situation where your bees are starving, I will tell you 100% without a, a doubt, feed them whatever you can. If you have sugar. If you, have, if you have honey, preferably, but if you have sugar, you're going you're gonna to have to do it. It will be pretty dumb to watch your bees starve and say, I haven't bred bees that are, uh, are able to cope with starvation. <laughs> That's just not going to work. So you've got to be a little smart in this whole thing. You've got to be a smart beekeeper and, and practical, as Michael Bush says, and do the right things. Okay, so if your bees are starving, you need to feed them. Allow your bees to build drone comb. All right. Think beyond your own colony. Think about bees in general in the area. Remember, drones fly up into the sky, into what we call drone congregation areas, where there are thousands of drones flying around. So if you have a lot of drones, if your bees are making drones and there's a lot of drones in the area, that's a sign of good health. And the Virgin Queen, when she exits the hive, she will fly out and fly through that cloud of drones. And the strongest, the guy with the biggest eyes, he's going to catch up to her first. And he's going to be the first guy in there to meet. So you're going to keep your, your genetic diversity at its maximum once you allow the bees to do whatever they want to do. As I said before, don't import queens and don't import bees. Um, personally, in natural beekeeping, I don't like to use excluders. Um, a lot of people call uh, queen excluders bee excluders. They create a back, a back pressure for the bees trying to get through. They knock pollen off their legs, that sort of stuff. So I would try to stay away from uh, using excluders. There are situations where you have to use it to try to um, work things out in your hive. Um, you try to reduce the amount of manipulations you do in a hive. You allow the bees to grow naturally and to grow with their stores. And as they, as they build, they will build with the, with the season and the nectar flow. And when that's reduced, they will reduce again. And your job really is just to give them room to expand or remove excessive uh, wax that they don't, um, that they can't manage if you want to keep your bees like that. But there are situations that are in nature, natural, that, and I've run into it and I heard it mentioned last night, is that sometimes you, uh, you go somewhere, somebody uh, has a swarm in a wall and you cut it out, you cut out the wall and you look at it. And you find that that's been there for years. And what has happened is that as the bees build comb and it expands, it's fine. And then in the, in the dearth, the bees reduce the population. And there's comb that the bees don't take care of. And wax moth will come in and eat that comb and, and destroy it and recycle it. And there's been a sort of a, a documented now relationship between bees and wax moth. But we go, as soon as we see wax moth in the hive, we're like, oh. Now, of course, we don't really want them to take over, but it's a sign that the hive is weak or, and that we maybe that we need to do something. So, are you 
interested in doing natural beekeeping. I have a, a course on natural beekeeping. Um, if you go to my website, www.thehoneybeesteward.com, you can sign on for a free introductory lecture on getting started with bees. And then I have several uh, lectures that you can you can sign up for that you can learn beekeeping. Now I I believe that in order to be a good beekeeper you need to learn a lot about the the way the bee is and what she does and, and what they do and how they live and what their uh, how they work, how they gather honey a bit about biology not a whole bunch but something about it you know something about how they uh, the different um, the different jobs that bees have you know the forager the pollen gatherer the water gatherer um, all of these things I'd like to I, ha I present as a foundation for beekeeping whenever you go into a hive you're going to meet situations that are going to you'll never have seen in a book. Nobody would have told you what to do now. But if you have a good foundation in beekeeping, you can make uh, informed decisions. For example, if you know the life cycle of the honeybee, you can decide if, um, if you've just replaced a queen, when you should come back to look for her. So I look forward to uh, working with you and learning with you and your questions and everything. I hope it should be an exciting time ahead of us all. So let bees be bees. <laughs>